I'm Dr. Miriam Jacob, and uh, we're talking to you from Cleveland Clinic about our pulmonary vascular disease program, and in particular, we're going to talk about pulmonary hypertension, um, how we treat it here with our multidisciplinary group. I want to introduce first Dr. Gustavo Horaci, who's our director of the pulmonary vascular disease program in the Respiratory Institute, and Dr. Michael Tong, who's our uh, director of mechanical circulatory support and heart transplant and has a lot of involvement in our pulmonary vascular disease program. Um, so where I want to start first talking with Gustavo is, um, you know, talking about what pulmonary hypertension is and how we explain to our colleagues who are the proper people to refer to us. Right. So pulmonary hypertension um, is really not a disease in and of itself. It's just a term that describes elevated pulmonary pressures, elevated lung pressures. The key to understand about it is that it is caused by a number of different conditions, and the treatment is highly dependent on the reason behind it. So we have pulmonary hypertension caused by left heart problems, which uh, mm -hmm. typically we will treat together with you and your team in cardiology. We have pulmonary hypertension due to lung disease, like chronic obstructive lung disease and pulmonary fibrosis, which we will treat uh, directed to the lung problem. We have pulmonary hypertension due to chronic blood clots, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, where we involve our surgical colleagues and, and the multidisciplinary team that takes care of those patients. And finally, we have a large group of, of patients with pulmonary hypertension due to either some underlying conditions such as connective tissue disease and others, or also pulmonary hypertension without an underlying cause. Those are the patients that we tend to treat with uh, pulmonary hypertension specialized medicines. And so the evaluation and, and, and treatment of these patients is highly complex, and we, all, we always recommend that uh, at least uh, for the first round of evaluation and treatment, patients are referred to a specialized center. And I think one of the main uh, points that's really important is the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension requires a right heart catheterization, and it requires one done properly. Um, with the right uh, values derived. And also, you know, currently our guidelines say that we define pulmonary hypertension with a mean pulmonary artery pressure of 25 uh, with a pulmonary vascular resistance of three or more um, but and with a wedge pressure less than 15. But as we both know, we all know in the World Health Symposium, there was actually new discussion about what we should talk about as the cut point for pulmonary hypertension. So, Gustavo, what, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, that, that is an important point of discussion. So as you pointed out, the most recent World Symposium on Pulmonary Hypertension came out with a recommendation to define now pulmonary hypertension as a mean pulmonary artery pressure of uh, greater than 20 millimeters of mercury with a pulmonary vascular resistance greater than three wood units. Um, and so this changes uh, a bit the landscape because now that we're going to have a larger population of people with, uh, with, with, uh, we, which we can diagnose with pulmonary mm -hmm. hypertension. I think uh, there are two key points to understand about that which I'd like to emphasize. The first one is I, I don't think this new definition is a mandate to treat more patients. This new definition is a mandate to diagnose these patients earlier and to have more awareness of the disease. Mm -hmm. Uh, because the, the second point is that we see a lot of patients with these mild levels of pulmonary artery pressure elevation that are uh, due to underlying conditions, obesity, left heart disease, lung disease. And as I discussed earlier, these conditions typically do not require these specialized medicines that we use. So I think the new definition is just a call for all of us, for the medical community, to be more aware of pulmonary vascular disease and try to find these patients earlier to provide counseling, monitoring, and in selected cases, therapy. And I think that's important, treating underlying disease as aggressively as possible. And then if they have a large precapillary component of pH, deciding if we use pulmonary vascular specific medications. I mean, I think we have now 12 on the market. So we have a lot of uh, opportunities, but like Gustavo said, I think those are for those people who have scleroderma-related pulmonary hypertension, idiopathic, familial. So um, 
but with our lung patients and our heart patients, we need to specifically get at treating their underlying disease well. So one thing I want Gustavo and, and Mike to kind of talk about a little more is our chronic thromboembolic disease program here. Um, it's one of the only diseases where we can actually cure pulmonary hypertension short of lung transplant, which we will talk about as well. So I wanted you guys to talk about you know, the program and how it's structured. So Mike, if you can talk to us about yeah, that. So um, in patients who've had a history of a pulmonary embolus, in, in most cases uh, with uh, anticoagulation, um, the pulmonary embolus will, will resolve. However, there is a subpopulation, subset of population who, uh, whose uh, PEs will not resolve or uh, will, patients will have recurrent PEs. And in these patients, they will often get scarring uh, that uh, develop inside the pulmonary vasculature and the pulmonary arteries. And uh, over time, that can lead to pulmonary hypertension and, uh, and uh, hence the diagnosis of a CTEF. And when, uh, when we see this, um, this is something that we can cure. So Gustavo, myself, and our colleagues from vascular medicine, as well as uh, from interventional radiology, we meet, uh, we meet um, um, almost on a weekly basis. Um, at least every other week to discuss all these cases that are, uh, of uh, potential patients that we can treat. And we'll go through all the imaging, we'll go through all the diagnostic evaluations, and, uh, and we'll meet with these patients and uh, we'll figure out what's the best treatment approach. Now, um, for patients who do have uh, elevated pulmonary hypertension due to this, and on imaging, either by CT scan or pulmonary angiogram, we can see that there's scar in the large vessels and, or in the, the medium-sized vessels. These are type of patients that we can take to surgery, and um, and on the heart lung machine, um, we would then cool the patient down to 18 degrees Celsius, and then go into circulatory arrest. And with a bloodless feel, I can separate the scar from the wall of the of the blood vessel, and um, and we can completely extract all the scar tissue there. And by extracting all the scar tissue, the pulmonary vasculature will open up, and the pulmonary pressures will drop dramatically. And these patients often will be cured of the, of the disease. Um, this is predicated on the, the scar tissue being in the, in the large vessel and the medium-sized vessels. Um, if the scar tissue is too distal and starts at the, the most distal vessels, uh, my instruments are not small enough to be able to get into vessels that are under two millimeters. Um, in those cases where the disease is quite distal, we do have new treatment modalities, particularly with the balloon pulmonary an um, angioplasty, or BPA for short, and, uh, and that's where our interventional pulmonologists can go, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, our interventional radiologists can go in and using balloons to go in and push the scar uh, out of the way to open up those segments. And that's also been proven to be very effective um, in patients who are either too high risk for surgery or in patients who have disease that's too distal that we can't get to in, uh, in standard surgery. And there are also patients who we've done uh, a hybrid approach where on one side you may have more more um, proximal disease and on the other side more distal disease where you know we don't get a full extraction with surgery and then the patients will undergo pulmonary angioplasty afterwards. So um, so the CTEP program here is, uh, is growing. We're on track to do to about 40 to 50 cases in 2019 and our outcomes continue to be excellent. And, and one of the reasons we have been able to achieve these great outcomes is the fact that we work as a team. We work in a multidisciplinary fashion with, uh, with um, multiple individuals with different skill sets and so that we can not only select the right treatments for the patients, but also um, uh, treat the patients together afterwards with all different types of modalities. Um, you know, in speaking to that, Gustavo and Mike work in this program together. Um, for those inoperable patients, have you found that BPA has been a great resource to us now, a great technology for us? Yes, I think so. I mean, it's really exciting times for this uh, particular field because until recently uh, for uh, patients where surgery was not feasible, as Mike pointed out, there were really not great treatment options. Uh, I will say there is a medical uh, therapy. We use uh, one of the pulmonary hypertension targeted uh, medications that uh, works in the small vessel component of this disease. Uh, but the reality is it's clearly not as effective as dealing with a mechanical complication or the mechanical basis of the disease. And so balloon pulmonary angioplasty has allowed us to 
treat a larger proportion of patients, uh, offering a mechanical solution to uh, the sort of the distal component of the disease. And yes, we are seeing actually really good results. Um, it takes several sessions, so it's not like I can clear out the whole pulmonary vasculature in one setting. Balloon pulmonary angioplasty requires several sessions because you treat different areas of the lungs in different uh, sessions. But after a number of sessions, and the average for our patients is about four to five with with a reasonable spread. We do see uh, people who have uh, major improvements in symptoms. We have people who come out of oxygen. Pulmonary pressures do improve uh, significantly. Uh, Some people achieve normalization, but uh, in terms of the hemodynamics, at least so far, and the experience remains a bit early, uh, the hemodynamic improvements are not as impressive as, as the ones achieved by surgery. But symptomatic improvement, um, functional capacity, oxygen requirements, all of them improve quite dramatically. So we have these, these surgical options for the CTEF patients, and, and for all our other patients who we want to treat with medications, we have all these 12 medications, and usually we're giving them upfront combination therapy, we're being very aggressive, but what happens when we've got a young person um, or a person who's getting sick really quickly and we're not sure, we've, we've exhausted everything, so the next thing is thinking about lung transplant, and as pulmonologists, you guys help us with getting our patients to lung transplant and our surgeons do these lung transplants. So, Gustavo, can you talk a little bit about who are the ideal patients that we need to send to lung transplant and refer? Yeah, so in, in, you know, in the current treatment era in 2019, uh, luckily we have, as you mentioned, a number of medications. And we have um, the, the treatment paradigm has shifted, as you know. Uh, in the past, we used to start one medication and we would wait until the patient deteriorate to add the second one. So nowadays we are more aggressive. We're in the era of upfront combination therapy with at least two oral medications. And if patients are really sick from the get-go or if they fail to improve, uh, they fail to reach our treatment goals, we quickly move on to an infused medication, an infused prostacycline therapy. So in a patient with triple therapy that is not improving, who remains quite short of breath, functional class three or four, with significant hemodynamic compromise, a low cardiac output, a high right atrial pressure, speaking of uh, ongoing right heart failure in spite of maximal medical therapy, I think that's the patient that we need to consider uh, for lung transplant evaluation. And this is a decision that we make pretty early. As I said, we are very aggressive with our treatments, and if we don't reach the treatment goals, we engage our uh, transplant colleagues very quickly because the transplant evaluation, as you know, is a process. It takes some time. Luckily, in the clinic, we, we are blessed with a wonderful program, and we can move things quickly. But I think in our, in our team, and I think that's one of the importance, uh, the importance of uh, issues of having a multidisciplinary team um, a center of excellence in pulmonary hypertension, we feel it has to offer the, the gamut of, of treatments, and that includes medical therapy, surgical uh, procedures, interventional procedures, and so forth. So I think we were very, very careful about that. Mike, you know, speaking to these patients, it's a smaller group of patients who mm-hmm. get lung transplant yeah. that are, have pulmonary hypertension, but are, are there certain things that you find are challenges or ways to get the patient to transplant that, that's tougher compared to our COPD and ILD patients? Yeah. Yeah, one thing with uh, patients with pulmonary hypertension who are truly end stage um, is that these patients can deteriorate very quickly. Uh, with the pulmonary hypertension, often the right heart will be under tremendous amount of strain, and and the right heart can can fail very quickly in these patients. And with uh, every transplant patient, there is going to be a wait time. Um, the the duration of the wait will depend on many factors. It depends on if the recipient has uh, any antibodies. It'll depend on their size. Um, it depends on the blood group. And sometimes the wait time can uh, can take uh, a few weeks uh, at the minimum, and often can take a few months or even longer in, in certain situations. So, um, so the key is to get these keeping these patients stable and getting these patients safety to a lung transplantation. Um, and um, luckily, the uh, lung allocation score is designed so that the sickest patients will have the highest priority, um, but there are still patients who won't make it in time, and that's where mechanical support comes into play. Sometimes we will need to put these patients on, uh, on ECMO um, so we can, uh, we can buy them more time. We've had uh, 
uh, really good uh, success with our ECMO program, getting these patients safely to lung transplantation. Um, we, we just looked at our, our outcomes for the, uh, between uh, 2012 to 2016, and over a four-year period, we had a successful bridge of almost 90% to lung transplant. And the patients who were on ECMO getting to lung transplantation, once they had their lung transplantation, their outcomes were just as good, if not a little bit better than than um, than the, the patients who weren't on ECMO going to lung transplantation. Now, I'm not saying that every patient should be on ECMO going to lung transplantation, but um, you know these are t- typically uh, tend to be younger patients, so we expect them to have a better survival afterwards. But it just shows that with um, with a, a proper a proper team, a proper program, and uh, and with the, the right technology, uh, we can safely buy these patients more time so that they can safely get to transplantation and have a great result afterwards. You know, I know we meet weekly in the pulmonary hypertension group. The lung transplant team meets weekly, and I think us talking about our patients and coming up with a plan and what a, what happens next is always important. I know for the lung transplant team, you guys talk about is ECMO an option to get to the next thing. In our in our group, we talk about well, what is the next thing? So we're never giving up on figuring that out. Um, you know, real quick to talk just about our research efforts here at Cleveland Clinic. Um, We do a whole group of pulmonary hypertension trials here, uh, including patients from all these different flavors of pulmonary hypertension, lung disease, heart disease. Um, Are there a couple you want to highlight or things that are really unique to us? Yeah, so um, as you pointed out, there are many medications now and they are very effective, but none of them cure the disease. So, So the search continues and also, at their core, all of these medications are pulmonary vasodilators. Uh, they may have some other effects, but basically they open up uh, constricted pulmonary arteries. So we are looking now at different mechanisms of action. So we have our own investigator uh, initiated uh, frequently NIH funded studies. We're looking, for example, at uh, influencing the disease with diet and exercise. Uh, we are participating with other centers also using metabolic modulation uh, in pulmonary hypertension. We also participate in uh, sponsored trials, of course, and uh, one large area of need uh, are those patients with pulmonary hypertension due to underlying conditions where we know that a lot of these medications don't work quite well. So we have ongoing trials, one that you're leading in pulmonary hypertension due to left ventricular diastolic dysfunction. We are now having also trials looking at pulmonary hypertension due to lung disease, both COPD and pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, investigating the role of inhaled uh, vasodilator therapy. So, yeah, so there's a, there's a gamut of, uh, we have a research portfolio that uh, I think it's important to find the next, the next me- new medication. And also I should point out, uh, we do a lot of uh, basic and clinical translational work. We have a biobank, we, we're looking at biomarkers, we're looking at new pathophysiologic uh, pathways in this disease to find new treatment targets. You know, our group, I think what's really exciting about the working here and doing pulmonary hypertension is we take care of the patients, we, I think, properly diagnose them, we get them down the right path of medical management or surgical management, and then for every patient, we screen them and say, would you be a great participant or a good person for a clinical trial to help us understand and give them access to newer medications, technologies, et cetera? Um, you know, are there any other things, thoughts that, Mike, you want to say about pulmonary hypertension disease management in general or mm-hmm. things that you want to make sure people understand? Yeah, I think, um, I think uh, just to uh, circle back to what Gustavo said in the beginning, pulmonary hypertension is, uh, is, uh, has a lot of different underlying diagnosis and getting to the right diagnosis uh, it, and getting to the correct diagnosis early is what really matters. Uh, for the long-term success of treatment for these patients, so, so um, I think um, I, I think the uh, the index of suspicion has to be high if you have patients with short of breath, um, and uh, who've had a, either history of PEs or who have uh, other underlying lung disease. You know, think about this early and uh, and think about uh, getting the diagnosis uh, early and and figuring out the underlying cause. Um, you know, often it is left uh, left side of alveolar issues or left side of heart failure. That's uh, the cause of what we can easily treat. If this is CTEF, um, we can easily easily treat this. I mean, it's so common for us to to see patients, um, and then you talk to the patients, you ask them how long the symptoms been going on, and, and they say they've been it's been going on for a long time, and they and it's only very recently that they really understood what was the underlying cause, and 
And uh, so getting to the right patients, uh, getting to them early, getting to the right treatment, um, and um, uh, those are all things that matters. And this is where a center um, like this, where you have a, a multidisciplinary team of physicians, will really be beneficial so we can tap into the expertise of each, uh, each team and member. Else, you want to bring up? Uh, yeah, so I think to build on that, you know, if you look at, um, you know, for we, we think we're doing a great job as a medical community, but if you look at the median time between symptom onset and diagnosis, mm -hmm. 30 years ago it was two years. Still two years. And right now it's <laughs> still two years, yeah. right? And so I think that for, 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 for us, for all the medical community, I think what Mike pointed out is really important. If you have a patient with shortness of breath, and you, you do this, the chest X-ray, the EKG, the pulmonary function testing, and you don't find an, a clear-cut diagnosis that accounts for the patient's symptoms. You, you have to think about pulmonary vascular disease. And the way to start thinking about it is with an echocardiogram. I think we should mention this. It's a good screening test to give a sense about the pulmonary pressures and how the right side of the heart looks. Uh, and then move on to the confirmatory test, which is the right heart catheterization. And we work with our referring institutions. We're happy to do the work up here as well. So it's just a, a relationship that, that we need to have with, with all the, the expert center and the, and the community physicians to uh, find these patients uh, as early as we can and offer the appropriate diagnosis and the appropriate treatment. Well, thank you. I really want to thank Gustavo and Mike for talking with us about this. We're really excited, as you can see, about our program, and we've had great successes. Um, so thank you so much.